Hello, I am Daniel Weiss, your host, and you are listening to my podcast. If you are a new listener, this podcast is about health, performance, nutrition, mindsets, and how you can put it all together to fit your lifestyle and your goals. In this episode, I had a great honor to interview Matt Fitzgerald. Matt is an endurance coach, nutritionist, and author who wrote more than 20 books on racing, nutrition, diets of the most successful athletes, the racing mindset. Basically, when it comes to living endurance, Matt has a book on it. So listen closely, have a cup of coffee, enjoy this podcast episode, and if you like it, share it with your friends. I'm also looking forward to reading your comments and your feedback on the podcast and on the episodes, so make sure to leave a review. And without further ado, I present to you Matt Fitzgerald. Once more, thank you very much for your time because, uh, well, I really appreciate it that you found some time for us to answer maybe some questions and share your expertise. Yeah, my pleasure. And yeah. yeah, actually, how long have you been in the business when it comes to performance nutrition, nutrition for athletes, for endurance athletes? I think it's from 1994. Yeah, well, I started as a journalist, so um, in I started uh, writing for a triathlon magazine in, in 1995, um, but I had no expertise in nutrition at that point. Um, so if I wrote an article about nutrition, I called up a real expert to get his or her opinion. Uh, but gradually, as an athlete and then as a coach, I um, I began to learn and acquire knowledge and I became a certified sports nutritionist in 2006, I believe. Um, So, you know, I I don't have the type of education that, you know, a scientist in this area would have, but, um, you know, I've learned a lot directly from, from scientists um, and, and top level athletes and, um, experience working with athletes we are on the same boat in this <laughs> uh well i would not like to waste any more time but because i have collected also some questions for you there are also some questions that i would like to have answered also from your perspective since you are already working with these athletes and i know that you know many people have the research have the like you know read all the studies all the papers and especially nowadays it's very easy to get to some information but you know i find it that often uh what is on the paper doesn't necessarily translate into practical sense or practical perspective and since you have been working with athletes i well well, let's start with our i would say very favorite question and it is like what is the best diet for or nutrition for endurance athletes okay i didn't hear the entire question but i think i understood what what is the best diet for endurance athletes yes Um, yes so um you know those absolute terms best worst um you know I'm a little bit resistant to them um, Mm -hmm. because, um, you know, there's some flexibility. There's room to eat in different ways um, and still get more or less the same results. Nevertheless, there there are certain um, certain rules that you really can't break. Um, You know, my my recommendation is what I call the endurance diet. I have a book titled The Endurance Diet, and it's just it's a collection of habits that seem to be. Uh, practiced very widely uh, by the most successful endurance athletes. Um, and really, um, there's nothing strange about it. It's just it's just a, a very high quality, well-balanced, uh, um, inclusive diet, not a restrictive diet, but um, one that includes every type of food um, in a nice balance. Um, and um, is based primarily in natural whole foods and tends to um, avoid or minimize uh, processed foods of all kinds, whether they're refined grains or sweets or fried foods. Um, And 
And so there's a lot of room to work with in that space. You know, you could you can eat like a Kenyan or you can eat like a German um, and still be on on what I would call an endurance diet um, and, and achieve the same level of success that way. Yeah, I think that is the perfect answer. So basically, it's like focusing on the whole food and excluding processed foods. And yeah, there is not like very specific way how to eat for everybody in general. Right, that, that has been my observation. Okay, and but in, uh, I know that also from your reading, uh, I mean, from reading your books and listening to some podcasts, you often recommend like, I would say, a little bit higher carbohydrate consumption, right, for endurance athletes. Yes. Again, you know, that's just um, that's based primarily on what you see the most successful athletes doing most consistently. Um, you know, if you, it, it's worth pointing out that uh, most um, most you know high performing endurance athletes do not count carbohydrate grams or or fat or protein. Um, they just end up with a fairly carbohydrate centered diet really just by eating like normal people and, and focusing on balance and quality. So even if you don't even know what a carbohydrate is and you really only follow my recommendations for high quality, you'll end up eating uh, you know, more carbohydrate than you do anything else. Um, and You know, there's more to be said on the on the subject than that. You know, if you actually manipulate how much carbohydrate is in your diet, you know, either try reducing it or increasing it, um, you know, you, you may get better or worse results. But it seems that most athletes who just focus on quality, um, they they naturally end up eating not necessarily a high carbohydrate diet, but a carbohydrate centered diet, um, and and that that works pretty well. Um, you know. The fine print is when uh, you're having uh, variations in your training load, going from a very high load to maybe rest, um, or uh, you know maybe an off season where you're more worried about cutting weight. Um, that's when it seems to have some value to actually pay attention um, to how much carbohydrate you're eating and to to set goals. Mm -hmm. So basically, that actually leads to another question that I had, uh, you know, some people follow these types of diet, like, I would say, or call it carb cycling, which is basically during the off season, they would go higher in fats and during in season as the training intensity increases, uh, their demand or their preference would be higher in carbohydrates. So Yeah, while still keeping the quality of the food high, of course. Right. Yeah. So y you see this. Um, this is a, a, a trend um, in in endurance sports, um, where you know that's something that not a lot of people did a generation ago. Um, it remains to be seen. You know whether um, there are additional benefits to Um, you know, periodizing uh, macronutrients in, in that way. Um, it's plausible. Um, but then, you know, you look at folks like Elliot Kipchoge, the, uh, you know, the Kenyan runner who just broke the world record for the marathon, you know, and East African runners in general, they don't do any of that stuff. You know, they just have a high quality, high carbohydrate, high carbohydrate diet every day of the year and they're the ones breaking world records. So um, I, I think, you know, I think it's very interesting the experimentation that people are doing with uh, carbohydrate cycling. And I do some of it myself to a limited degree. Um, I, I think there are definitely low risk ways of engaging in that experiment and seeing if you do um, get some benefit. But um, I think it's a mistake to assume that um, it's necessary, um, you know, to to um, you know uh, periodize macronutrients um, in that way.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so basically there can be some benefit, but uh, as I also study the nutrition and read articles and you know follow follow the media, let's say what I find is that often people see these claims and they might be true, but oftentimes what is not said is like what is the degree to which they are hold true, right? So maybe there is like difference in like performance benefit one percent, which might be yeah. Good I, I see for a lot of people like top who level athletes, latch but onto these tr- most, trends most when people who follow these kind of trends are amateur athletes, and for diet, them, this one percent you know, doesn't um, make any If I just picked a random right? triathlete or runner and followed him or her around for a day, I would probably see him or her eat a lot of low quality foods. Um, and, you know, and actually a lot of people who, uh, who adopt a high fat diet or experiment with one, their diet quality actually goes down, you know, because they're eating fewer fruits, more processed meats. Um, so, you know, it's okay to do these things, but you, you want to, you want to do things in the proper order and, and fix problems with your diet that are sure to have bigger benefits, um, before you start to do the, the fine tuning. Uh, type of stuff. You know, in terms of what we know about carbohydrate cycling, one thing we know is that um, doing uh, occasional workouts in a in a glycogen depleted state um, is beneficial. Um, you know, but that's just one tool uh, um, of many that you want to use as an endurance athlete. Um, so I think it's safe to recommend that most serious endurance athletes do some glycogen depleted workouts, um, incorporate those into your routine. Beyond that, we don't really know, uh, what benefits there might be to, um, you know, going high fat on rest days or or things like that. Um, those are, those are not, those are unanswered questions. Um, so if you want to start with what, what we really know for certain, it's, it's a depletion workouts. Oh, that's good because that's something that I've been doing for some while. <laughs> so oh, good. Uh, this is actually one, one of the questions that one person they wanted to ask, like, what is your take on intermittent fasting? And the other person was asking uh, intermittent fasting regarding running, like, you know, like faster runs or faster workouts. And then the other person uh, was asking also like, uh, exactly like glycogen depletion runs. And when you started with this, like you mentioned that doing it occasionally is okay or beneficial so what does it mean actually occasionally do we have any like better evidence because i also know there are a lot of athletes who basically do a lot of training right in the morning on an empty stomach let's say right yeah that that again you know we don't really know it's not a tool i would i would advise overusing uh because there are benefits to training in a high glycogen state as well. You will perform better in that state. And there's something to be said for setting yourself up to perform better. Um, So I I think that most workouts should be done in, you know, in a well-fueled state. Um, And maybe um, I think one session per week or one, even one every other week. Um, Last summer I trained with a professional American running team. Um, and members of that team would do, um, depleted long runs, uh, maybe once every three weeks only. Um, and so you, you will get, you know, you're benefiting because you get better and better at those sessions. So even with that limited frequency, you can run, you'll find you can run farther and farther and farther in a, in a depleted state. So, you know, your body's adapting even when you're only doing, you know, one or two sessions per month. In some of the studies, they go much heavier than that. Um, they'll have athletes do three or four uh, interval sessions in a depleted state per week and, and derive fitness and performance gains from it. But, you know, you know, the studies are a little bit artificial the way they're set up. I, I mean, you know, very few athletes don't even want to do back-to-back-to-back interval workouts in a week depleted or not you know that's just not the way people train so you know it's you don't want to just read a study and just copy the the protocol of the study as as an athlete trying to succeed in the real world so i would start on the side of caution you know and do um 
only you know one depletion workout every other week or maybe once a week yeah that's, that sounds good like personally i do this morning not workouts i would just say like easy or recovery runs on empty stomach and then like the serious session when there are like intervals or high intensity like you said in a fed state when i already have some food in my in myself like in the evening and yeah like i fully agree with you on that stake that there is a benefit on both sides so what i see that many people don't understand or want to achieve especially when it comes to longer distance running so to endurance sports is that they want to prevent bonking and they do it for these reasons so for like fat adaptation and for this reason they go for high fat diet and you know ketogenic diet i'm pretty sure you are very well aware of these things so but as far as i know you don't necessarily need to do these things regarding the diet regarding the fasted training also although these are the tools that can help you with fat adaptation Yeah, so, um, it, you know, and, unless uh, you are an ultra, ultra endurance athlete, you know, someone who's, you know, you know, participating in, in multi-day uh, adventures, um, um, and I'm talking about kind of nonstop, day and night type of racing, um, you know, which is only a small minority of endurance athletes. Um, if, if you're not in that small marginal group, then what you really want is not to be the best at burning fat. You want to be the best at burning fuel. Uh, you want to be good at burning everything. Um, you know, the, the athlete who wins any given triathlon or marathon is not the one who burns the most fat. It's the one who burns the most fuel. Um, and the athlete who burns the most fuel is generally really really good at burning carbs too so um again you don't want to make the mistake of of you know you know putting uh you know putting all your hopes on on just one tool um and and that's all fat adaptation adaptation is so when you when, when you do a high fat diet yeah you get really good at burning fat you also get really bad at burning carbohydrate and that's not not the goal um you know, just in my own experiment, uh, you know, well, my own experience as an athlete, um, I think there are a lot of athletes out there who think you can't do a very, very long bike ride or run um, without carbohydrate unless you're on a ha high fat diet all the time. And that's simply not true. Um, you know, I I've run as far as 29 miles with on water and not having had any carbohydrate since the day before and i'm i'm not on a high fat diet i could do that just because i'm fit <laughs> you know <laughs> because i have a high high level of fitness so you don't need all that uh so it's a it's a tool but don't overuse it yeah it's like you said you don't need to be uh specifically doing or be on ketogenic diet or high fat diet in order to reap the benefits of actually being fat adapted right so training and endurance training by itself by default leads to changes physiological changes that leads to fat adaptation and of course one of these things or one of the tools is the keto or high fat diet how you can achieve this but it's not the only way yeah that, that's right so we have another question here which is like uh if you have seen success with vegan or vegetarian, low carb, high fat athletes, uh, vegan, high fat. Yeah, um, that's very specific. <laughs> yes. Yeah, my <laughs> my answer to that is why. <laughs> you know, I I just I don't understand. I mean, 
you know, a lot of vegans, they don't eat animal foods for ethical reasons. Um, and, and that's fine. You know, that's not my job. You know, my job as a sports nutritionist is to help people perform better. Um, and I never recommend a high fat diet as a general diet or a vegan diet to an athlete who simply wants to perform better. Um, now, there are vegan athletes who perform very well. There are athletes on high-fat diets who perform very well. But there are also a lot who perform poorly, uh, who, who switch to those diets. Um, um, and I think they're riskier is, um, is, is the problem. Uh, so you're rolling the dice a little bit. There was a study, I don't know if you've seen it, published just recently. It was a case study involving an elite triathlete um, who was struggling with uh, gastrointestinal issues during races. This was an Ironman specialist who switched to um, a ketogenic diet and was studied uh, by the Spanish researcher, I think it was Inigo Mujica. Um, and that athlete was followed for, tracked for a year, diet and performance and fitness for a year. And it was a disaster. Um, you know, the athlete, this is a, an elite level athlete who, who performed much worse and felt worse on this diet. That's very, very common. You know, people who switch to either a, you know, a high fat diet or a vegan diet, or God knows, maybe some people do combine them. The people who do that and they feel it, it's a success, they tell the whole world. And so it creates this impression that it works for everyone. Um, it doesn't work for everyone. But the endurance diet, the diet I recommend, does work for everyone because the, there's, there's room for individ, individualization built into it. Um, so if you just find your place within the parameters of what seems to work for everyone, you're going to be fine. That's, that's the low risk way to go. Um, again, if you're going to be a vegan for ethical reasons, you know, that, that's your decision. Uh, you know, that's, but that's beyond my pay grade, as we say in English. Yeah, and I have been on a vegan diet myself for quite some time and I have seen improvements in my training. I improved my fitness and such, but this is also, I would contribute the success to, to the training itself. And definitely diet plays some role in it and I can work with it. It works for me currently, but I unfortunately know about people for who it doesn't work as well. But we have another question here, and this is like, uh, yes. do you have any experience with uh, the sports gels building up insulin resistance or contributing to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? This is an interesting health question. Uh, no, I, I don't know of any evidence of that. Um, if if um, if these ergogenic aids, you know, sports drinks and energy gels are consumed in the proper context, uh, which is during intense exercise, then there's no, no evidence that um, there are any negative health consequences associated with their use. Um, now, if you're just sitting in a chair at home watching television and eating energy gels, that could be a problem, <laughs> but you're, you're not supposed to do that. Um, so, you know, if, if you limit your intake of, um, you know, these sugar filled, uh, products to, you know, within the context of intense exercise sessions, I, I do not believe you have to worry about, uh, negative health consequences. Yeah. That's important that it's, uh, during or around activity that's high intensity exercise not like sitting or lying on a couch and uh, uh, smashing into yourself <laughs> quantities and quantities of these energy gels <laughs> not recommended but anyway people are still afraid to use them because you know it's they see sugar and that creates some kind of resistance in them yeah you know the, the people um you know Maybe you can include this in your show notes. I, I wrote a blog post um, a couple of years ago um, just addressing the question of what is the purpose of taking in nutrition during exercise? I think 
a lot of athletes don't even really understand what that stuff is for. It's not for your health. <laughs> you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner are for your health. The, the purpose of taking in nutrition during a race is not so you'll live longer. It's so you'll get to the finish line faster. <laughs> and and sugar is what gets you to the finish line faster. So, uh, you know, it's important to understand what, what purpose these, these, uh, these products are supposed to serve. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's definitely a very different case and scenario when you are uh, eating like simple sugars, simple carbohydrates versus complex. And that leads me to a question like, uh, how do you uh, fuel during like really long events like Iron Man and so on because uh, you don't want to you are limited by by palatability of the food you know you will get uh, fed up with certain foods so how how do you avoid it what's your what are some of your strategies like you know you don't want to be stocking just gels down your throat all the time you want to maybe get also some uh, real food yeah interestingly i i spent some time when i was researching the endurance diet with a professional cycling team a dutch team that was, uh, they were doing a training camp in Spain. And their nutritionist told me that because they're, these are professional cyclists, because often they're on their bike training so long, they're actually missing meals, that they actually try to consume real food on the bike. When it's a multi-hour lot ride at a lower intensity, um, where they can handle real food, because they realized that they, these athletes were taking in too much, you know, processed, high sugar, gels and, and stuff and you know even the bars um so they made a conscious effort it, you know they decided if, if, a, if a ride was going to be so long that they were missing a regular meal they would try to have a regular meal you know something they could digest while cycling but something that was also healthy now that makes a lot of sense but you know if it's just a, a you know you know a, a two hour hour marathon pace run um you know you can't you can't eat spinach during that <laughs> yeah that would be funny to see a marathon runner like running pacing himself and stuffing spinach down his throat <laughs> in his... okay maybe you can but i i wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> actually challenge accepted <laughs> quite an image <laughs> yeah of course it's not an ideal nutrition definitely during a marathon or well, any other race to stuff yourself with spinach. And yeah, so this leads to another question, and that is about how do you avoid having like gastrointestinal issues? But if you are a person who has really problems of di with digestion, like you cannot digest anything, and you know during these races or harder workouts or longer workouts. Uh, it can be detrimental to your performance or limiting your performance. Yes. You know, th there's, um, yeah, so, you know, gastrointestinal discomfort is common, you know, during en endurance racing. There is a tendency to automatically blame the gels and, and the sports drinks. Um, however, you know, what research shows is that the, the primary causes of, of these issues are, um, number one, the stress of the exercise itself. Um, so there are a lot of people who, who will have uh, GI issues, even if they don't consume anything or, or just water. Um, and then also some people just have a, uh, an inherent susceptibility to these problems. So it's just, it's simply normal because, uh, I mean, for the same reason you, you end up with sore muscles at the end of a race. It's, you know, these things are very stressful. They're, they're tough on the body, including the GI system, especially running. Um, so that doesn't mean that nutrition, that you can't manipulate your fuel in ways that um, maybe will reduce the risk that you, you have problems. But um, a what a lot of athletes find is that if they have that susceptibility, it really doesn't matter what they take in. That being said, um, you know, there are a lot of options out there. And I encourage every athlete to experiment if they do have problems uh, to, to try different things 
And, um, you know, usually if you do that, if you go through that process, you can find, um, you know, a, a, a recipe that, that works best for you. Yeah, and there is actually part of the truth is that you can train your gut. Yeah, that's a great point. And many people don't think about it or they want to avoid these gastrointestinal issues. They don't do it. And that is what long runs or long rides are for. You train with your uh, race day nutrition. And like you mentioned, the stress is something that has a big effect on your digestion because the blood is um, directed from the stomach into your uh, muscle. So you are not able to process or digest as many your carbohydrates, sugars, yes. as you would normally. Another thing is that you need water to actually process it. That's why there is like you should drink some, um, I don't know, for example, a deciliter of water or two deciliter of water, dilute it, uh, dilute the gel with the diet. And then also important point is that the gastrointestinal issues also come from if you just digest too many carbohydrates. Right. So yep. for me, it can Very be true. like 30 grams, for you, it can be 60 grams per hour. And it gets stuffed in your stomach and if you are if you are not able to digest it then the problems come yeah and here we have another question that's from dave and he's asking like what were the major differences in training when comparing the professional running camp that you attended and the way you used to train okay yeah so um so that's a reference to this uh, professional team I trained with last summer for the Chicago Marathon. Um, you know, I, the, the biggest difference in the way I trained there uh, versus how I, I trained for marathons independently before um, was that uh, I, I did more of my high intensity training at, at, uh, slower paces. So, um, at lower intensities within the high intensity range, if that makes sense. So, um, to make it more concrete, less training at 5k and 10k pace, more training at half marathon to, to marathon pace. Um, so the, the total amount of running was similar and the total amount of high intensity running was similar, similar, but, um, within that high intensity range, it was mostly toward the, the lower end of that range. Um, and I just found that, um, my body recovered, uh, better, um, from that, but, you know, I, I was, I was running, um, 80 to 90 miles per week. Um, so what's that in kilometers, 120 to 150, um, kilometers per week, which is a lot for me but I handled it very well. I felt very good, um, most of the time. Um, so, uh, that's, you know, since I've come home, that's the way I've continued to train. And did it also affect your nutrition in any way? A little bit. Um, you know, um, so I lived with one of the, the runners on the team, a, a runner named Matt Yano. Um, and he's, he's, a he's a, a, a good example of what I mean by the endurance diet. Um, he's not on any weird or special diet. He, there's no name for it. I call it the endurance diet. Um, but it, for him, it was just healthy eating. Um, but it was, you know, he, he had just, it was very high quality balance, like lots, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and all that good stuff. Most of his grains were like non wheat, uh, grains. Um, a little bit of red meat, little fish. Um, and so I ate a little bit more like him there. Um, you know, my diet is very good at home, but I just, you know, I, I was trying to do everything like the pros, but like the professionals there. So, um, you know, I cut out, I drank less alcohol <laughs> there, um, less cheese, less chocolate, um, just tried to clean things up a bit. Um, uh, there wasn't a lot of room for me to improve, but there was some, and, and I, I did that. Um, and I, I did lose weight there. Um, so, uh, 
Um, and you know, I ran my fastest marathon at the end of that process at, at the age of 46. So definitely, you know, what I did there on both the training and the nutrition side, uh, was beneficial. I was also training at high altitude for the first time in my life as well. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And so basically we are back to the basics, focusing on high quality nutrition, high quality diet, whole food sources. And yeah, it's simple as that sometimes, right? Yeah. And many people focus on different things, but don't have the basics handled. Now we have another question, which is, which I hear very often, and that is like cramping during the race and yeah, how, how to prevent cramping. And have you ever experienced yourself cramping? Uh, you know, fortunately, uh, not much, um, similar to gastrointestinal issues, uh, you know, muscle cramping in competition is something that some athletes seem to have a, a genetic uh, predisposition for, unfortunately. So usually if you cramp during a race, you cramp during most races, or at least most long races. Um, and I am not one of those people. I, I, I've had, I mean, I've done a lot of races in my life. So yes, I have cramped, but I, I don't very often, um, fortunately. Yeah, there seem to be like uh, people who have tendency to cramp more than the other, but uh, you know there, there is a lot of confusion. I think about it. We are not very sure like what is exactly behind it, and I think what really right. contributes to it is like uh, not even magnesium deficiency. Like you see people all the time. Uh, stuffing themselves with magnesium and liquid magnesium but uh, lack of general preparation you know like you come into the race and you overload your muscle like you've never done before or for an extended period of time and that leads to uh, experiencing a different kind of stress to the body which leads to cramping Right. Yeah. So, you know, what the research has shown that is that, you know, previously it was believed that it was either dehydration or electrolyte depletion that caused muscle cramping. Um, but the research just doesn't bear that out. Um, if, if you are, if you are severely dehydrated, that can lower your threshold for cramping, but it is not the major cause. It, it's, um, it seems to be, you know, uh, that, that's why it, it almost always occurs in races is that um, it, uh, it's sort of, uh, it's your neuro, neuromuscular system uh, panicking in response to an unusually high level of local muscle fatigue. Um, if it were dehydration, your whole body would cramp probably, uh, but it tends to occur in uh, you know, either, you know, the, the primary working muscles, the calf muscles or the, the hamstrings. Um, and so, uh, one way, as you suggested, that you can uh, uh, inhibit that panic response during races is to simulate races a little bit more in your training. So the the level of fatigue that you experience in a race isn't that unusual. Um, and then also, you know, there's this um, uh, this trick. That, you know, some people will take um, pickle juice um, or other other spicy tasting products. Um, there's a direct link between your taste buds and your tongue and your brain that can uh, inhibit that um, that reflex that causes your muscles to go into spasm when you do reach a high level of fatigue. Uh, it's nothing. It's not really the nutrients in pickle juice or other products. It's actually the experience of tasting uh, that spiciness. I know it sounds weird, but the brain is weird. So people who are susceptible can use uh, these products uh, prophylactically, um, you know, just take it uh, immediately before a race or you know, early in a race to reduce the likelihood of cramping during the race. So would chili peppers work for that since they are spicy? <laughs> um, it, it, there's a, there's a, cl I don't think so. Um, it, 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 there's a certain class of nutrients um, that, 
that tend to do the job. So, um, but, um, you know, so things that are, are vinegar based, um, will, will work. Um, and there are also, um, you know, I don't know if they're available, how widely available there are, there are but uh, there's a product called Hot Shots, for example, in the U.S. That it's it's like a you know a little energy drink um, that is designed specifically for this use, um, and you know it's just it's more convenient to use uh, to take on site uh, to a race. Um, but uh, are there any products that you would recommend or some for? troubleshooting cramping yeah so th there are now products available that are designed that are based on this science um uh so there's one product called hot shots that's available in the united states that uh seems to work pretty well for some cramping susceptible athletes yeah so there's a good news yeah it's a very very frustrating problem Okay, thanks, Matt. And let's get back to another topic or back to the diet topic, which really interests me. And that is like uh, when we are speaking about the quality of the food and you have several books on that. Uh, can you tell us more about your book or your approach that you call the endurance diet? Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, the, this term diet quality is not talked about a, a lot. You know, athletes and, and, and people seeking to lose weight tend to be very focused on macronutrients, carbs, fat, and protein, carbs, fat, and protein. And, um, and, and this concept of diet quality is something that nutrition scientists discuss a lot, but the general public and the athlete population don't. And... Uh, a, a high quality food is simply a food that is associated with positive health outcomes uh, in you know epidemiological research. So if they if they look at a large population of people and they track their diet and their health over a long period of time and they find that gee people who eat a lot of vegetables tend to have less cancer, uh, then you know uh, vegetables will be considered a high quality food not because of anything that's in them, but simply because eating lots of vegetables is associated with better health. Um, and so that's all, a, that's all a high quality food type is. And there's been a lot of research that looks at what happens when people eat more or less of different kinds of foods. Um, so there, they have developed various indices, uh, um, uh, a ways of scoring the quality of a person's diet. So if you put all of the high quality food types together uh, and look at what happens when people eat a lot of all of these foods and not a lot of the low quality foods, they they have generally found that those are the healthiest people. So it's not all one food. It, 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 it's not a matter of saying, oh, what's the highest quality food type and I'm just going to eat only that. No. <laughs> You actually, they're additive because they can, different types of high quality foods contribute to health in different ways. You know, so nuts are high quality, but they contribute to your health in, in very different ways than fruit contributes to your health. So if you combine them both, you end up even healthier. Um, so, you know, generally, you know, the different indices disagree a little bit on the details, but for the most part, high quality food types are fruits, vegetables, uh, nuts, seeds, and, and healthy uh, plant oils, um, unprocessed meat in moderate, moderate amounts, and seafood. Uh, you can lump eggs in there, um, unprocessed dairy foods. Uh, and then low-quality foods are the, just the refined versions of all these things. Uh, so refined grains, sweets, uh, fried foods, and processed meats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... If you are, let's say you are already eating like high quality foods, unprocessed, you are focusing on whole foods, or selection of whole foods, vegetables, fruits. I know that, you know, these foods can be very satiating. And how can you, as you mentioned in your endurance diet and that uh, athletes who follow the endurance diet or these top athletes, they don't count macros and so on they just eat intuitively so how can 
you yes. achieve this kind of intuitive eating? How does that work? Right. Yeah. So um, generally, if you if you increase the quality of your diet, you know, unprocessed foods do tend to be more satiating. Um, so if you are overeating, often you can correct that problem simply by increasing the quality of your diet. Now, in a country like the one I live in, in the United States, um, it's an environment where our society constantly encourages us to overeat. <laughs> um, it's just an environment where everyone's afraid of being hungry. Um, and, and people just, even if they are eating high quality foods, they tend to eat more than they need to. Um, and, and in that case, you need to, to relearn how to listen to your body versus listening to your environment in order to uh, eat the right quantity of, of, of foods. And, but research shows that, that you know, I, I deal with athletes all the time uh, who, who tell me, oh, you know, I don't get hungry or, you know, I don't know when to stop. Um, but that's not really true. I mean, it may be true now, but, it, you know, babies, uh, infants know when to stop eating. They don't overeat. And, and we all have those natural appetite regulatory mechanisms in us. We just, we, we, we're trained to ignore them, but you can relearn how to listen to them. In, in my book, The Endurance Diet, I, I talk a little bit about how to do that, to, to relearn how to listen to your own internal appetite signals. Okay, perfect. And we have some more questions here, but I don't know how much time you have left for this interview. Yeah, I have a few more minutes. I was uh, hoping to, to, to go swim uh, at, at one o'clock my time, but if you have a few more questions, I'm happy to answer them. So here's the question. Kristen wants to know, like, how do you recommend using the concept of periodization for training with your 80-20 training? Right, so the, the 80-20 principle is the idea that... Um, Uh, endurance athletes tend to improve the most in their fitness and performance when they do 80%, roughly uh, 80% of their training at low intensity and 20% at moderate to high intensity. Um, that does not mean you have to do this um, every week of the year. Um, there are times when you want to do more or less uh, than 80% of your training. But that, that should be, when your goal is to uh, maximize your fitness for an upcoming competition, that's about where you should be, 80-20. Um, and, and so when, when you're just sort of building a base of fitness, um, generally it, it's okay and perhaps even preferable to be closer to 90% low intensity or even 95% if you're a very high volume um, athlete and just you know, sprinkle in a little bit of high intensity training here and there. It's a little bit, it's stressful on the body when you, when you're trying to increase the total volume of training you're doing and increase the volume of high intensity you're doing at the same time, that's very stressful. So usually you should just be focusing on one or another. So, um, you know, if you're a long distance athlete and you're coming off a, a, an off season break, Um, and you want to focus on building your volume, then it's smart to do most of almost all of your training at low intensity, just in order to build the volume of your training in a way that's not too risky. And then once you're, you've gotten to a level of total volume, that is, is where you want to be. Then you can start to, uh, do a, a higher percentage of your training, um, at higher intensities. So go from, um, say 90 10 to, to 80, 20 without increasing the total volume of your training or perhaps slightly decreasing it. Um, and then in the taper period or the, the peaking period, you know, the, maybe the last two weeks before an important race, that's when you want to really bring your volume down, but still retain some of, uh, or a lot of that high intensity, the research, it's counterintuitive, but the research shows that high intensity is your friend, uh, during the last two weeks before a big race. So maybe in those two weeks, you're doing 30% of your training at, at higher intensities, but you're doing a, a much smaller total amount of training. So your body is still getting a chance to process fatigue and recover so that um, you have fresh legs for the race. 
Yeah, and uh, regarding ta tapering, I read just recently there was a study done that when you cut back the training, the, the training volume actually the last week before the race, and you keep the intensity or even increase it, it leads to about 21% increase in performance during the race, which is like counterintuitive for many people. Yeah. It's not something that a lot of athletes, they don't do that because it doesn't seem right, <laughs> but it, it does, it does seem to work best. Yeah, great. And now that we are actually speaking about training periodization, we spoke about this, uh, let's say, mesocycle or microcycles, but let's take a big look, big picture approach. So uh, let's look at the whole cycle during the year. And now it's a, we are actually approaching the off season. So what tips would you give people on uh, how to start their season or how to train in the off season, how to program for the off season? Yeah, well, you know, it's important to start your your off season with rest. Um, you know, so after your last big race, um, you should do very little training of any type or uh, just do fun, different activities. So, you know, if you live somewhere that has snow, uh, you know, get out on cross country skis or snowshoes or, um, you know, do some hiking or climbing, you know, stay active, but just give your, your, both your body and mind a, a break from the grind of whatever your primary sport is. Um, that's an important step. You know, there are so many athletes who, when they finish a season in, in a high level of fitness, their mentality is, Oh, I don't want to lose this. Um, but actually the best way to be a better athlete next year is to give away some of your fitness at the end of this year, go ahead and, and give it up because your body need and your mind need a chance to regenerate. Um, and then when you get back into it, um, you know, I like to have see athletes focus on, uh, weaknesses or on types of training that they can't prioritize as much, um, you know, during the, the competitive season. So that, that's a good time to focus more on, you know, strength and mobility training, just, you know, you know getting your body balanced and strong so that you have a good foundation to build the endurance fitness on, uh, later. Um, if you, um, if you want to, uh, if you're, if you're above your racing weight, you know, if you're an athlete who doesn't have, who hasn't yet optimized his or her body composition for performance, the off season is a good time to, to work on that as well, uh, to, you know, to, to change your diet and train in ways that are more conducive to losing excess body fat versus increasing your fitness level. Um, and then, you know, uh, then it's time to start rebuilding another, you know, base uh, for for the next season, and that's yeah, that's the time to really focus on uh, you know uh, and you know developing uh, an increasing volume of mostly low intensity training. So we have basically increasing volume, focusing on strength, mobility, and handling something your weaknesses. Yes, and then and then sharpening or you know peaking for for competition. And then here is a question from a different side or different spectrum. And that is when it comes to racing regarding the mindset, how do you push yourself during the race? Like how do you find that balance between like uh, enduring, but at the same time, uh, you know, <laughs> going for the best time, best pace possible without overshooting it. Right. You know, there's, uh, it comes mainly from experience. Uh, you know, there's, you know, there's no formula or calculator or device that you can rely on, uh, to execute the perfect race. It, 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 you have to depend on primarily on your own perceptions. Um, and, and, and those are honed through experience. You know, nobody is, is, is good at pacing a long distance race on their first try. Um, you know, if you watch young children, the first time they do maybe a, a one kilometer or a five kilometer run, they all start, you know, way too fast and, they, and then they're walking halfway through. Um, 
but through experience, you get better and better. So it's okay to make mistakes because though you learn from them and, and you, you get uh, better and better at this. So just, you know, let that process happen, but you also don't want to miss opportunities. Uh, so you need to sort of pay attention and learn from each race uh, so that you're able to better read and interpret your own perceptions. You know, when you get into the, the middle of the next race, you know, you, you just you get a you get a more and more refined sense for how you should be feeling, you know, at each point within uh, a race. And I know that's not a very satisfying answer to some people who just want they want a formula or they want their watch to be able to tell them what to do. But um, I actually think it's it's good that that's not the case because it's a skill and it's a skill that you can be better at than than other people and it gives you an advantage. Um, you know, the fittest person to start a race doesn't always win it. Uh, you need to be able to, uh, that's why they call it a performance. Um, you know, you need to be able to execute, uh, to know how to pace yourself intelligently, uh, and bravely <laughs> to, to a certain extent. Uh, you know, you have, to, it takes a certain amount of toughness, um, especially in, in the latter stages of a race. Um, but just, you know, learn from and take advantage of the process so that you're always improving in your ability to execute races. And yet I see all the time, like, athletes who go into the race, like, the first time, they overshoot it in the start, they go just too fast. But the interesting thing is that they don't learn from their mistake, and they do it again, you know, in the next race you see them, the same people, and they do the same thing again. And then in the next race, yeah, again, and they are wondering like, what am I doing wrong? Yeah, um, yeah. It, there's you know, it, there's research showing that um, intelligence is part of it. That uh, uh, individuals who have um, uh, cognitive impairment, uh, so you know, lower IQ, um, are not as good at, at pacing. They're they're not as good at learning to from experience because they have a harder time comprehending large distances. Um, so part of it is actually, you know, you need to be tough and brave so that you can handle a high level of perceived effort. Um, you need to be good at reading your body, but you also have to be smart. You know, good, good pacing is, is a cognitive skill. Um, so if you have a good brain, use it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And well, I appreciate your time, Matt, um, but I don't want to steal any more of your precious time. Hopefully we'll connect later in a different podcast episode. But for mm -hmm. now, I'm letting you go. And th thank you once more for uh, having time for us, answer these questions that are important for many people and bringing more clarity into our athletic life and maybe even personal life. All right, fantastic. I, I enjoyed talking to you, Daniel. And before you leave, is there any any big news that we are expecting or you are expecting in future or in the new future, maybe a new book, some race or anything important that people should know about? Yeah, so actually it, uh, it's funny you ask. Just yesterday, my, my latest book was published here in the, the US. It's called uh, 8020 Triathlon. So it's a, it's a triathlon specific follow up to my 8020 running book. Brand new. Well, that's exciting. So thanks again for your time, Matt. You have a great day. Thank you. And all who are listening, I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode and if you liked it you know share subscribe i'm running it by myself so all the likes all the love from your side is appreciated and let me know in the comments if you are here how you liked the podcast episode did you enjoy it what would you improve and let me know also maybe who would you who you would like to hear or see in the future episodes or what topics would be interesting for you and in the meantime, let me tell you that I am opening my gates to few more people to work personally with regarding their nutrition and training, especially for endurance, plant-based people and people who are passionate about OCR, obstacle course racing, which is my sport. Having said that, I bid you farewell. You have a great day. Have a great time. 
and hope to see you in the next episode.